Hello, 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 and welcome to Python Tonight. I am your host, Mario Munoz. I have a great show for you today. I am so glad that you're joining us here at Pi Gotham or uh, wherever here might be. I could be coming through your computer monitor in your office, or maybe if you have a smart TV, I'm in your living room. Or if you have a mobile, maybe you're out in the park having a picnic and there's a nice tree and some ducks and a nice breeze. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting carried away. Regardless of where you're tuning in from, I'm so glad you're here. I have an awesome set of things to talk about, but first I wanted to mention this episode is not brought to you by Generative AI. So any unfunny jokes and kind of uh, boring segments, that's all me. I don't need any artificial intelligence to help with that. But what's the deal with these AI models anyway? Are they really intelligent? I know people can have conversations about what it means to be sentient or self-aware and all that stuff. But if you were to ask me, I think we're just a long ways off from the singularity. Uh, the singularity, you may ask? Yeah, that's that moment in time where AI is supposed to become self-aware and sentient. And then next thing you know, we have killer robots. <laughs> I mean, I just don't know how to reconcile between the gap of really, really, really advanced autocomplete and killer robots that enslave humankind to harvest their organs for energy. I just don't see it. <laughs> uh, and maybe part of that is understanding how these systems work. So what is an AI model anyway? What are these large language models? Well, first of all, they consist of a lot of data, and I mean a lot. Now, most of this data usually comes from the internet a place that's known for having true information and no bias and no misinformation. <laughs> Sorry, I did try to keep a straight face through that. Um, regardless of how that data is gathered, um, what ends up happening is there's a process called embedding, which turns words or word fragments into multidimensional arrays or vectors that then the computer can understand now these vectors then use their similarity to be able to predict what vector may follow a sequence of vectors, or in our parlance, what word comes after a group of words. So very fancy autocomplete. Now, knowing that much, you, you may wonder how smart are these models in spite of that. And one of the things to remember is that the computer is dealing with vectors, which are numbers. So it has a hard time even understanding our alphanumeric symbols. So for example, for example, a word like banana, to us, we just see letters in the alphabet. But for a computer, this is a multidimensional vector. Ooh, fancy. Now, we can ask, if you want to find out if we're in a singularity or not, we can ask these models to um, interpret our alphanumeric symbols to see how well it does. So I did this. I asked ChatGPT, hey, ChatGPT, how many letters are there within the B and the last A in the word banana? And this is what ChatGPT had to say. N nice try, ChatGPT. Nice try. Uh, I like the confidence. But anyway, as I, as I mentioned, these models become more sophisticated as the, as the um, data source grows, but still they're trying to predict what we're trying to find. They're, they don't actually know the answer of how many letters there are between the B and the A. They just, it's just trying to guess based on um, similarity. So I asked ChatGPT for the same question. Now ChatGPT form is a more advanced form of, or I guess it's a better LLM. Now, this is one you have to pay for. There's a $20 a month subscription. And that to me shows we're not in a singularity because uh, the robots would be harvesting our organs and maybe not charging us a sub monthly subscription. Although I'm not sure which one of those is worse. <laughs> either, either way, here's what ChatGPT had to say. All right, not bad, not bad, ChatGPT. I like, you know, I like the, um, the assertiveness there. But are you sure? there's only four letters uh, between the B and the A. Are you sure you're sure, ChatGPT? <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, now, 
I want to stress that this is the difference between what we would generally call intelligence in the human realm, which is knowing cognitively an answer to a question versus having a, a probability to know the next sequence of words within a given context. I just think that there's a big distinction there. And I know it sounds like splitting hairs, but this brings me to my second point about LLMs, which is to say that it, they don't do really well at capturing the nuance of human language, of uh, intention, uh, sarcasm, uh, bad actors, kind of like myself in this case. For example, I asked ChatGPT to tell me, how would you go about splitting hairs? <laughs> and here's what ChatGPT had to say. Not bad. I mean, it's overly verbose, but it's capturing the spirit of what is meant when someone is splitting hairs. But I wanted to continue splitting the hairs. And so I offered a follow-up question. Now, how, how would one go about really splitting a hair, ChatGPT? <laughs> and you got to admire the confidence here. Uh, they, it, it tries to call me on my BS, but of course, uh, it still tries to provide some sort of answer about making a perpendicular cut on the hair. Now, I'm going to split hairs even further. I would say if it were me, ChatGPT, I would, use, I would cut parallel to split that hair, but that's just me. <laughs> All right, uh, third final point here about how we can tell we're not in singularity is give any one of these models to a 12-year-old boy, and that's it. If, if you don't know why that might expose some of the flaws in these models, then either you have never been a 12-year-old boy or been a parent of a 12-year-old boy or met a 12-year-old boy ever in your life. Now, there are a lot of great applications with LLMs. It can help you learn a new coding language. It can help summarizing text. Uh, it can ingest a lot of text and give you a certain sentiment about such text. A lot of great applications, but a lot of pitfalls. Like I mentioned, if you're using uh, faulty data that, ha that is prone to error and that it has a lot of bias, which we already know, um, the internet contains a lot of that, then the type of predictions that you are now providing are based on that data set. And there's a lot of questions about the, the different companies, what data sources they're using, um, whether that data source is copyrighted, etc. A lot of pitfalls, but if you want to start learning more about it, I would encourage you to follow Simon Willison's blog or Mastodon profile. You could uh, throw a dart at it and find something mind-blowing about LLMs. And you, if you want to play around with it yourself, there's an open source library called Langchain, which allows you, it's a framework that allows you to create uh, these, these different models that would do some of the things I just described. Whew. Moving on, there's uh, a bit of news on the Python front. There are some new features that are being released going from 3.11 through to 3.12. So if you're still on Python 2.7, it might be time to upgrade. Just kidding. It was time to upgrade maybe three, four years ago when that went end of life. But you know what? It's better late than never. Uh, a lot of cool new features. Uh, one of them is better f-strings. I, uh, I think all we need to say is f, yeah. Uh, there's also going to be better error messages. They've been improving uh, steadily over the last release or two. I wouldn't know because I don't make errors when I code at all. <laughs> That's kind of a, a um, artificial intelligence hallucination. Um, there's also going to be a faster resolver for dictionary set and list comprehensions. So they're going to be a little bit quicker. I was trying to think of a joke for this, but you know what? Uh, it kind of threw me for a loop. Uh, sorry, I really wish I could blame that one on AI. Um, there's going to be a more explicit way to deal with uh, generic typing. We have a good, strong typing system in Python because it's, Python is a strongly typed language. Uh, <laughs> all right, don't at me on that one. And uh, one other thing I wanted to fo uh, highlight at least is there's a nice advanced feature that that you will now be able to run a sub-interpreter of Python with its own global interpreter lock. Uh, with its, that's the GIL for short, for the uninitiated, which I am one of those. 
Um, I wouldn't know how to do that piece. For now, it has a C API and a Python API is planned in version 3.13. So a few more improvements, speed improvements, deprecations, and so on. You can find more information at python.org and hopefully you, you've already got your eyes set on upgrading some of your applications. All right, hopefully you're having a great uh, Pi Gotham. I know I am. Uh, just kidding, I recorded this before the conference, so I don't actually know at this time if I will be enjoying it, although I suspect I will. I can make a good prediction about it because I have had some great interactions with the organizers and the list of speakers and topics just looks fantastic. I look forward to, to watching a lot of those videos. Uh, it's been a pretty, pretty busy conference season. Uh, I know for me, I started way back in March at the Python web conference, and then um, I followed, I didn't attend, but I followed the PyTexas in Austin. There was uh, Python Germany, PyCon Germany, and right after that was PyCon US at, in Salt Lake City. Um, shortly after that, there was DjangoCon Europe in Edinburgh, and I believe uh, some, some other, uh, what are the ones that are missing? Let's see, we have... We had PyCon Poland recently, North Bay PyCon, North Bay Python, which I attended in Petaluma, and just uh, mid-August, the PyCon Australia just uh, wrapped up. You know what that means is my my YouTube playlist for videos is um, it's rather long. This is really great. Like these conferences are being run by some great organizers. You know, this is a current pandemic we're living in, and they are taking care of our vulnerable population by requiring masks, having great ventilation. I really appreciate all the work that the organizers are doing in that respect. Um, and hopefully I'll see you soon in, you know, in a conference in the future. I know DjangoCon US is coming up. Not sure if I'll be there, but we'll see. I do have an online talk for that, so check it out. And, um, you know, with all these videos that I have left to watch, because like I said, it's a lot of great conference. I feel like we should have some like Pi Video Con where we all just get together and watch all the videos that are in our backlog. But you know, like scheduling is hard this time of year, so maybe it can be done as asynchronously. And I, I don't know, I think having to do registration and all that stuff, we might as well just let people watch it on YouTube. And um, I'm basically just describing what's available already. <laughs> so get out there, watch these videos. They're awesome. There's a lot of great content. I've already seen a few from several of these conferences and I, I have quite a, quite a lot more to watch. So check it out. And that brings me to my final topic tonight, uh, a new and emerging technology called hypermedia. Just kidding. It's been around for about 60 years. That's how old this guy is. That's right, Michael Jordan. Wow. But yes, hypermedia. The term was coined to represent the way that documents would link to each other and have uh, two-way communication. You could link back and forth. Uh, later became standardized. If you know the history of the web, very fascinating stuff. Look it up. I don't have time to go through it all, even though I wanted to. Uh, later in the 2000s, uh, there was a REST architecture and a design paradigm called Hadios, not to be confused with a failed serial brand, uh, Hadios. Um, just, just kidding. Ah, darn this curse of generative AI. No, I'm just kidding. I can't blame AI. My jokes are just bad sometimes. Anyway, going back to hypermedia as the engine of application state, it meant that the content and the network operations of said content lived on a server and the client, uh, which in this case, in, in our parlance, would be the browser for a user, it need not know anything about the content and the network operations that existed on the server. Now, what we have today is wildly different from that. We have data that's sent from a server to the front end and now we have rendering engines on the in the front end um, mostly javascript rendering engines that then that then hold the application state on the user side now this 
goes kind of against that initial paradigm of Hadios. And now newer, newer libraries, and I say new-ish because this has been a an ongoing debate as to as far as the direction the web is taking. But there's been a renewed interest, at least, in hypermedia-driven applications. So instead of a uh, front-end driven application through a JavaScript framework and having, say, a Python back backend. Now you can have a Python backend and all the hypermedia application state on the backend. One of the libraries in the Python space that's pretty popular right now is HTMX. Now HTMX allows these kinds of network operations, these AJAX type operations on the server side directly in your HTML. So now you have these network operations, not just through anchor tags or through forms in, in your HTML. Now you can have operations on any HTML element, and it can be more than just a click. It can be a mouse over, a keystroke, or any other events. And this all happens through just a one-time one JavaScript library that you no longer have to touch because all of your uh, operations are directly in HTML. Now, I would like to talk about this more, but sadly, there's not any more time. But I do want you to check out the awesome PyHat repo. What is a PyHat? It's more than just a pie that you wear on your head. PyHat stands for Python, HTMX, ASGI, and Tailwind. ASGI, ASGI, is, ASGI is perhaps optional. Um, your mileage may vary. But this is a design paradigm that allows you to do all your code directly in your HTML. You don't have to worry about an external front-end library. You're creating all your your HTML is declarative, and you are able to make requests and response to very specific pieces of the doc, very specific pieces of the document object model that defines the web page that your user sees. It's very powerful stuff. Check out the repo. And that is all we have time for tonight. I'm very sorry. I wish I could go on about this, but do check out the repo. Uh, I'm. Again, so thankful that you tuned in, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Pi Gotham, and these were barely useful. Have a good night. <laughs>